Mercury is the closest to the Sun planet, and it's also the smallest one in our solar system. It's as big as the Moon, and they even look a bit similar, gray and rocky. This planet is also covered with tons of craters and impact basins. Those are the results of asteroids crashing into the planet's surface over hundreds of thousands of years. If you ever visited this planet, moving around would be extremely tricky since, besides craters, there are also cliffs, and some of them can be a mile high. But you'd see not only dry, lonely landscapes. On Mercury, you'd have an opportunity to enjoy truly stunning sunrises and sunsets. This planet has a very stretched out orbit and fast orbital spinning. Thanks to that, Mercury can occasionally have more than one sunset or sunrise happening at the same time. And you'd be able to see the sun rise, set, and then rise again over the horizon. But now, let's figure out if it would actually be possible for you to make it out alive if you landed on Mercury. I want to make it clear from the very beginning. The chances are pretty slim. Imagine landing your spacecraft and stepping out onto Mercury's soil. The first thing you'd need to worry about is that it's either terribly cold or insanely hot on Mercury. And no matter what option you prefer, you wouldn't survive either of them for more than two seconds. On our home planet, the day lasts 24 hours. But on Mercury, the day lasts 1,408 Earth hours. During this time, sunlight heats the planet up to 800 OF. And when the planet faces away from the sun, the temperatures there drop to 290 F. That's a very inhospitable environment, to put it mildly. One more thing you should know before setting foot on Mercury is that this planet has a very weak atmosphere known as the exosphere. It's created when solar winds hit the surface of the planet and send particles flying into the air. As a result, it's just a thin layer offering little protection from solar radiation. Even if you somehow manage to survive till this point, the solar radiation would finish the job. Mercury receives 11 times the amount of solar radiation we experience on Earth. This would be a challenge for your spacecraft's equipment, and obviously, it would be even worse for humans. Space radiation is, in general, a great danger for astronauts working in space, causing lots of health problems. On Mercury, it would be even worse. A human body that has received a large dose of radiation over a short period of time suffers from radiation sickness. How bad it is depends on the absorbed dose, the time of exposure, the strength of the radiated energy, and the distance between a person and the source of radiation. On Mercury, it would be bad. A person stepping out of their spacecraft without sufficient protection would almost immediately feel nauseous. Then other symptoms would follow. Even if the astronaut retreated back into the safety of the spaceship right away, it wouldn't mean being safe. A person with radiation sickness might have a brief period with no apparent signs of the illness. But later, there's usually an onset of new, much more serious symptoms. But if you somehow manage to predict all these dreadful scenarios and protect yourself from all dangers, exploring Mercury could be kind of fun. Mercury is much smaller than Earth. It means there's weaker surface gravity there, a mere 38% of the gravity on our planet. You would weigh much less on Mercury, and if you decided to jump there, you'd be able to leap four feet into the air. No astronauts have set foot on the planet yet, but two spacecraft have visited Mercury, and the third one is scheduled to arrive there in 2025. Unfortunately, due to the planet's proximity to the Sun, even the Hubble Space Telescope has issues pointing directly at Mercury. That's one of the reasons this is the least explored planet in the solar system. Hey, take a look! It's Earth. It's sailing through our solar system, and torrents of hot charged particles are crashing into it at a speed of around 1 million miles per hour. Those particles are called the solar wind, and it comes directly from the sun. How come you don't feel it? That's because Earth's magnetic shield protects you. It kind of deflects the harshest gusts of this wind. And nothing more than a light breeze gets through the planet's atmosphere. Every now and then, you even get to see Aurora Borealis, 
beautiful light shows caused by solar winds for all your troubles. Unfortunately, everything can and will change with time. Earth's magnetic shield won't be able to protect the planet infinitely, and solar winds are only getting stronger because our star is gradually approaching its inevitable demise. Oh yes, the sun, which has been providing us with heat and light for millions of years, shines on borrowed time. In five to seven billion years, it will swell into another type of star altogether. The sun will become a red giant. When it happens, the view will be spectacular and breathtaking. But inside the solar system, it will lead to a catastrophe. What do you need to know about red giants? They're enormous. You think the sun is large? Well, maybe it is, with its diameter of more than 865,000 miles and weight as great as that of 300,000 Earths. But that's nothing compared to a red giant. To become one, the sun will have to grow to more than 100 times its current size. Scientists claim that the range of potential outcomes of such catastrophic scenarios usually depends on the size of the planet and the state of its parent star. Thanks to Earth's size and the distance to the Sun, it's unlikely to get devoured completely, unlike Mercury and Venus. But the Sun is bound to make our planet unlivable. See for yourself. A team of astronomers has calculated that solar wind will intensify in the next 5 billion years or so. That's when the Sun is supposed to run out of its fuel, hydrogen. At the moment, the core of our star is about 74% hydrogen. But when the sun burns through most of it, helium will become its main source of fuel. After our star has consumed almost all of its hydrogen, its core will become way smaller and much hotter. This will intensify nuclear reactions going on in the core. With this additional energy, the outer layers of the sun will expand. You can probably guess that with a radius 200 times greater than the current one, the Sun will soon swallow Mercury and Venus. As for our home planet, there are two potential outcomes. Either Earth's orbit will expand far beyond the Sun's reach, and we'll all freeze. Or our planet would be pulled toward the star and engulfed by its unbearable heat. Imagine this. The Sun is growing bigger and bigger in the afternoon sky with every passing day. It balloons into a monstrous red sphere. The solar wind is so powerful now that it starts to erode the magnetic shield of our planet. Soon, there's nothing that can protect us from the unforgiving sun's rays. The solar wind blows the largest part of Earth's atmosphere into space. And with it, we lose the last protection from tough stellar radiation. Even if some life on our planet has managed to survive this long, it will be wiped off the face of the Earth. In the past, a similar thing happened to the Martian atmosphere. At the same time, Mars has never had a large-scale magnetosphere. Unfortunately, recently scientists have found out that our magnetic shield won't be enough to protect Earth forever. And the more time passes and the older our sun becomes, the more damaging its solar wind gets. Anyway, what'll happen after the sun swallows Mercury, Venus, and probably our beautiful blue Earth? It'll keep expanding for another billion years or so. After that, our star will collapse into a white dwarf. A white dwarf is what's left after a star has run out of its fuel. These space objects are among the densest out there. They're also pretty dim. Massive stars usually go supernova, but those with a low or medium mass eventually turn into white dwarfs. Around 97% of all stars in the Milky Way galaxy will become white dwarves in the end. If it happens to our sun, it'll keep smoldering for another couple of billions of years, and then its light will flicker out for good. Anyway, if, by some miracle, Earth manages to survive the sun's transformation into a red giant, it'll have to exist in a very different solar system. If the star doesn't swallow our planet, its gravitational pull on Earth, as well as other planets, will weaken. It'll cause our home planet to drift away from the sun. But at the same time, the solar radiation the newly born red giant will start to ooze will get way more intense than it is now. But the main problem is that red giants aren't only incredibly large, 
They're also unbelievably hot and shine thousands of times as bright as the sun. Most of the material the future red giant sun will eject, which can be half the mass of the present time sun, will get to the outer edges of the solar system. If it happens, even asteroids will melt, losing most of their mass. Their rocky nuclei will be the only thing left behind. Meanwhile, at the moment, the sun is still a yellow dwarf. It's a ginormous ball of gas and scorching plasma. The star's core takes up to 25% of its entire radius. Inside, gravitational forces create incredible temperatures and pressure, which make hydrogen fuse into helium. The core itself has a temperature of 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. All that energy moves to its radiative zone. It takes, on average, 170,000 years for the energy to get all the way from the core to the next convective zone. There, bubbles of hot plasma float upward and end up at the sun's surface. That's where a visible 300-mile thick layer starts. This gassy zone is called the photosphere. It gets heated up to 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This layer consists of granules, cells of plasma 600 miles in diameter each. Moving further, we get to the crown. That's the star's thin atmosphere. Shockingly, it's even hotter than the surface of the star. Temperatures there reach 3.5 million degrees Fahrenheit. Scientists suspect that powerful bursts of heat from the sun might have something to do with this unique phenomenon. To imagine how big the sun is, it's probably enough to know that the star has a diameter of 109 times the size of our planet. You could also fit 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. Or, if you had nothing better to do, you could flatten 11,990 Earths and use them to cover the surface of our star. The sun also accounts for more than 99% of all the mass in the solar system. But there are way, way bigger stars out there. If you decided to replace the sun with the largest star people know about, the giant would reach Saturn. The sun is a middle-aged star. Astronomers believe it appeared about 4.59 billion years ago from the solar nebula. Different parts of the sun rotate at different speeds. To observe this phenomenon, you can concentrate on a sunspot and start tracking its movement across the surface of the star. Just don't forget to protect your eyes. Areas at the sun's equator need about 25 days to finish one rotation, while regions near the poles need 36 days or so. As for the inner parts of the sun, they need no more than 27 days. The sun is traveling right now, and fast. It's moving at a speed of 137 miles per second. It takes the star 225 to 250 million years to complete its orbit around the center of the Milky Way. By the way, the distance between Earth and the Sun isn't always the same because Earth's orbit around the Sun is elliptical. So, this distance ranges from 91 to 94 million miles. You're standing on the bridge of your super modern spaceship. Today, your mission is to fly to the uncharted areas of space. You travel past beautiful nebulae, spinning pulsars, and black holes. Soon, you'll arrive at the planet where life might exist in the most unusual forms. You'll shake hands with a strange bug the size of an elephant, and maybe even establish diplomatic relations with it. This might happen in the future. For now, humanity is just trying to get farther into space. People first took to the air in 1783, when French engineers built the world's first hot air balloon. But it only rose above the ground for a third of the height of the Statue of Liberty. In 1903, the Wright brothers made the first flight in a controlled airplane. Since then, people have been reaching higher and higher. These days, modern airplanes can climb to an altitude of 8 miles. It's like 34 Empire State Buildings stacked one on top of another. In 1931, people finally got to the stratosphere. A Swiss physicist and his assistant used a hot air balloon to reach a record height of 9.8 miles above Earth's surface. They were the first people in the world to observe the curvature of the planet's horizon. 30 years later, the first person flew to space. It was Yuri Gagarin. He launched from Earth and reached a low Earth orbit in about 10 minutes. The maximum altitude of Gagarin's spacecraft was about 203 miles. 
that's almost like the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. The first cosmonaut traveled over the night side of Earth, flew over America, and successfully landed 108 minutes later. Nowadays, the distance of 250 miles into outer space is nothing. At this altitude, the International Space Station orbits the Earth. Astronauts from all over the world stay there at all times. In 1969, Apollo 11 set a new record for the most distant flight to space. Its crew flew about 238,600 miles to the moon and landed successfully on its surface. The mission stayed on the satellite surface for about 21 hours. Then, the crew successfully returned home. A year later, this distance record was broken by the Apollo 13 mission. It looped around the moon and returned to Earth. At the farthest point, the astronauts were more than 248,000 miles away from home. That's like circling the globe 11 times. It's still the longest distance people have ever traveled in space. But we intend to break that record by flying to Mars. Once every few years, Earth and Mars line up in such a way that the distance between these planets is 34 million miles. If there was a highway from Earth to Mars, it would take you about 62 years to get there by car. A trip by spaceship would take about six to eight months. When we get there, humankind will become multi-planetary, and that will be a new space travel record. For now, people have to rely on different probes to gather all the necessary information. For example, the Parker Solar Probe was sent from Earth directly to the Sun. It flew a distance of one astronomical unit to its destination. That's about 93 million miles. The probe has already made several circles around the Sun and Venus. But the Sun's gravitational pull is so strong that the probe's speed is now more than 330,000 miles per hour. That's 13 times faster than the speed of the average rocket. Another probe, Voyager 1, holds the title of the most distant object created by people. The probe, which weighs as much as a large motorcycle, was launched in 1977. After a year of flight, it reached the asteroid belt beyond the orbit of Mars and headed toward Jupiter. The probe took several pictures of the gas giant and flew toward Saturn. After visiting all these planets, Voyager 1 set a course for interstellar space, planning to leave the solar system. By 2004, the probe had traveled about 94 distances from the Earth to the Sun. That's where you can find the boundary of the solar system, the so-called heliosphere. Here, the solar wind slows down below the speed of sound. This creates a shock wave. It nearly tore Voyager 1 apart. But luckily, the probe survived and continued on its way. In 2012, Voyager 1 finally left our solar system and is now flying toward the star Gliese 445. It's supposed to reach it in 40,000 years. Voyager 1 has a twin brother, Voyager 2. Though the second probe was launched earlier, it left the solar system six years later. In 300 years, Voyager 2 will reach the inner edge of the Oort cloud. This is a cluster of small asteroids and space bodies around our solar system. In 40,000 years, Voyager 2 will pass the red dwarf Ross 248. And in almost 300,000 years, the probe is supposed to come close to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. Perhaps the Voyagers can make contact with another civilization and pass them the message they carry on their golden disks. The disks contain greetings in 55 languages and music from different cultures and countries. There's also sounds of the ocean, bird songs, chirping of insects, and different animal sounds. There are also 116 images that may help other civilizations understand the composition of Earth's atmosphere and the structure of human DNA. Some images are just landscapes from our planet deserts, mountains, islands, and rivers. Anyway, to make humans a multi-planetary species, we would need to go to Mars. It'd take less than a year. But if people decided to become an interstellar species, we'd have to travel to Proxima Centauri. It's the closest star to our sun. Light from this red dwarf reaches Earth in a bit more than four years. But if you decided to use good old rocket engines, the journey would take you about 73,000 years. The key to long-distance travel is speed. People would need to scrap the traditional rocket engines and come up with something new. Some scientists say we might reach Proxima Centauri before the end of this century. To do that, people will create a microprobe that will be smaller than a fingernail. It'll be launched into space, 
And then, a powerful laser beam from Earth will push the probe forward, allowing it to reach 20% of the speed of light. In this case, the probe's journey to the nearest star will take about 20 years. But even after its arrival, radio waves with the probe signal will reach Earth with a delay of 4 years. But if we could travel at the speed of light, how far would we get? Here's the Milky Way. It would take over 100,000 years to travel from one side of its spiral to the other. And if you bought a ticket to the Andromeda Galaxy, the journey would take you 2.5 million years. About 100 million years of traveling at the speed of light, and you'd leave the Virgo supercluster. All the little dots you see there are actually huge galaxies containing billions of stars. One billion years on the road, and you'd be in the neighboring superclusters. Now, these dots are actually superclusters with billions of galaxies. 14 billion years of traveling, and you'd reach the edge of the observable universe. This is the maximum distance Earth's telescopes can see. There are about 2 trillion galaxies within these boundaries. Each galaxy may have stars like our Sun. Around each star, there's a habitable zone, a sweet spot where water can exist in its liquid form. That gives a chance for life to appear there. People would love to find this life and make contact with it, but the distance of billions of years of traveling makes that impossible. There's a theory that people can travel billions of light years away using wormholes. Imagine that space-time is a piece of paper, our Milky Way galaxy is on one side, and an unknown galaxy is on the other. A straight path would take billions of years. But if you fold the paper in half, these two worlds would be right next to each other, and you'll be able to get there through some kind of hole. A wormhole. It warps space-time, which can allow people to become a multi-galactic species. Some scientists say there may be wormholes inside black holes. These are the most mysterious and massive objects in the universe. They're so heavy that they can also warp the fabric of space-time. One minute near a black hole could be a week or a month on Earth. Perhaps if a spacecraft could withstand such a wild gravitational force and get into the heart of a black hole, it'd pop out of the other end of the wormhole. It could be somewhere in another part of our galaxy. Or another galaxy. Or it could be a parallel universe. The closest black hole to Earth is 1,500 light years away. It's called the Unicorn. It weighs about the mass of three suns. It means the thing is very small compared to other black holes. Some of them can weigh 6.5 billion solar masses.